shining spirits. <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you? I am great. Excellent. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> what a what a run. What a run. What a run you're on. I really am. It feels so natural and so relaxed, and I feel in my own body with it all. Uh, it's exciting because I've committed to the work, and the work is in front of me all the time, I'm doing the show called Revolution. And Is it the uh, future that you worry about, what revolution is? Yes. That is something that has me thinking very deeply. Yeah. And because it's about all the people in this room, and you and I, that have to really throw down to get the world back on track. Right. And I think it really, it, it will take some very courageous moves to convince folks to let go of all the power they've given to the big corporations so that we can start to take back our earth and our world and our organized thought uh, and really start to determine what our future really should be. It's interesting because you have this career now that seems to be on your terms and a comfort level that's on your terms, but in the very beginning of you acting, it was, it was just this thing that you did because it was your duty to your family? Is that essentially how it played out? Yeah, in the beginning, in, in 1966, I started acting, and, and my father and mother were divorcing. I had some talent, and it, I really just wanted to help not be poor. I wanted to help my mom not be poor. I didn't want, I hated the food stamps. I still carry around a food stamp, um, little canister of food stamp coins. They used to give you change, yeah. you know? Uh, and I didn't want to, and that poverty mentality is, has tracked me all of my life. I always say to people, if you're just trying to live and trying to survive, then you're not able to create because you're like that, you know, hamster on that little, you know, wheel. You, you really can't get in touch with what you're here for. And everyone is here for a reason. At a certain point, you must have felt the pressure to be a breadwinner in the family. You must have felt that kind of whatever that is. Like, how did you figure your way through that? Well, I had to get rid of the resentment of the obligation that I had left my childhood behind. And I had to, to really get wrapped around the fact that I was given this really great gift because I love what I do. So then when I stopped thinking about it as work mm -hmm. and think, th started thinking about it as play, then everything changed. Right. You know? yeah, great shot of you at play. Oh, I like it. Just so good. Where is this picture yeah. here? First of all, let's go. What do you got? What do you, you got? got? Oh, my goodness. We don't, we don't mess around oh, here, sir. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Look at you... that. Oh, whoa. Now, is your brother Whoa, in that as well? Oh, that's my brother is right here. Yeah, and that's you right there. Right? And that's me right here. Oh, my good. And Jack Cassidy, mm -hmm. father, why can't right? I bring the curtain down? Yeah. Maggie Flynn, Jack Cassidy, Shirley Jones, orphan kids in the South. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. I will never forget this man. He gave me my first Mickey Mouse watch. You are killing me. <laughs> oh, this is, this is fantastic. So I've heard you say you're on your third stage of this, and that's what's interesting because you had that, and when I first came to you was through the Spike Lee joints, right? Mm -hmm. that, I was like, who is this guy? And between you and John Turturro, I thought there are <laughs> two new actors that I have never seen yeah, the likes be of fine, before. Pal, uh, super working class, really Italian, to be honest, that's right? right. Um, and part of this Spike Lee culture, which is unbelievable. Well, I love Turturro uh, for many reasons, but one, you know, I'm half Italian, Giancarlo Giuseppe Alessandro Esposito, yeah, there I am. Uh, a, a half Neapolitan and half African American, and so I always relate to both parts of myself. But you know, I just, I mean, you know, he see me sitting here with my hands like this. Yeah. I just gesticulate a lot. I, I find that my Italian part of my being is full and complete. And so, uh, yeah, you're laughing over there. But there's an expectation that you're, that you're an African-American actor, and I'm sure you, you've faced a lot of that. I certainly have, yeah. and Spike uh, taught me quite a bit in my discussions with him. We had such huge and large disagreements about um, being uh, racist and prejudiced and all these other things, and we've sort of grown up together, and we go back and forth, and we have little arguments, and, and I think I've taught him a lot, and I think he's taught me quite a bit. I understood that. I mean, there are a lot of actors who reach a certain point, certainly you, who's been a part of this industry for a long time. Especially if you are a person of color in any way, distancing yourself from, I don't want to be the guy that plays the drug dealer. I don't want to be the guy that does that. Were you going through any of that at a certain point in your life? Oh, yes. Uh, I had to make some very big decisions in my life because, you know, for me being an Italian, I had to learn how to be black. Because I came here to the US and I wanted to be just a human being and accepted, but I realized there was black and white. Mm -hmm. And I realized as an actor I had to find my root. So I played Spanish parts, I played black parts, but they led me always to being the criminal. Right. And I decided, hey, you know, there's something else in here for me. I'd like to be non-conventionally cast, but that would take an effort to say no. And uh, Sam Jackson came out years ago and said, I'm not a role model. And that was his stance on it, where I thought I really was a role model. I have to be a role model because there are people looking at me. Right. And there are young people looking at me. And on this third rise to start, I mean, when Breaking Bad, all the young bucks know me. 
and they want to be that guy, Gus Fring. They relate to that world. So for me, I had to say no for many years. I had to stop playing um, drug addicts and, and stop playing thieves and criminals and killers because I didn't want to you know, put that forth anymore uh, as an example of what you could be. Right. And to me, it was important to change it. Going back to what I said earlier, you know, changing me. So I didn't work for a little while. Uh, because I kept getting those calls. But then I got a call to play a lawyer on Law & Order as a guest spot, and they saw that I could put the words together. They saw that I had some charisma and yeah. some charm, and I decided that that's the way I wanted to go. The whole Breaking Bad phenomenon for me, I said no, I said no, I said no. And I said yes for basically one reason, because I had met two Mormon boys in Utah, and those boys got lost in the Midwest doing their spiritual sabbatical, mm -hmm. and they wear their white shirts and their black tie, and they go door to door, and they got sucked up in the meth world. And I took the role of Gus Fring because I wanted to be a part of a show that exposed that world. Interesting, yeah. Even though I was playing the big drug I kingpin, I thought if a show had an opportunity to show real life about somebody, Walter White, struggling in his life, dying of cancer, wanting to do some good out of the bad. Feeling like a healthcare system has abandoned him and a government's abandoned him. That's right. Yeah. So he does something, uh, he breaks bad for a good reason and gets sucked up in it. Equally so, that's probably what happened to those two Mormon boys I read about in the paper. I wanted to be a part of something that allowed us to know in America and all over the world that this is a legitimate lifestyle for people. Right. And it's a harmful one. Stick around more with Giancarlo Esposito right today. <laughs> Wow, you're awesome. All right, coming up, I want to find out why people are yelling at Giancarlo on the street and what is it that they're yelling. Okay, how we lose the truck? It stalled out. The townies and Dwyer and me in a hard place. And Sean grabbed the chance to use his shiny new weapon. We were in an explosive situation which jeopardized the entire mission. I simply defused the situation. That's just beautiful. I mean, you really have a way with words. He did get us out of it, Alex. Dwyer, you'd still be getting thrown around by those townies oh, if you hadn't oh, loose the live round. Wow. And this is what, the reason that's tabs is with you and, of course, Sean Penn and Tom Cruise, but I... What I'm curious is when you, you've been a part of so many groups of people and you've played a major role, these ensembles, where it's become the stuff of legends and you've worked with these wonderful people. So can you use that experience now to identify in others? Go away and tell me what we have here is special. We don't know, this could be something. Do you Absolutely. Have, yeah? Absolutely, sure, certainly in TAPS, I knew that Tom had such a great talent. Uh, I still am in touch with Tom a little bit, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm in touch more with Sean Penn. It, it's so interesting you show that clip because Tim Hutton texted me just last night, I'm gonna be in Austin, where are you? Yeah. And I tell young actors, you know, if you're with a group of actors who are really committed, um, you don't try to slay each other, you try to make great music together. Speaking of music, who remember the first time you heard your mom sing? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I wanted to show you this, because this is such a beautiful, look at this, man. Look at this. Oh, whoa, come on, Jean McMurray. Yeah. Oh, and Elizabeth Esposito. Oh, wow, look at this photo of my yeah. mom. Oh my goodness. Isn't that great? I, I want your researchers on my team. Yeah, they're great, man. We got the best, we got the best in the game. I really want your we researchers the, look on my team. Look at that shot team. of this man. Oh my gosh, my mom is 87 years old. Oh. And I, I just, ah, uh, she taught me everything I know. Yeah. She really did. She taught me to be attentive. She taught me to be personable. She taught me to commit to my talent. She trained my voice as a singer. And Isn't that what got this whole thing started? That's what got this whole thing so started. We had uh, Stephen Bauer on the show, who's also in Breaking Bad, and he was talking about the way people react to him, his role in Scarface. How many people walk by you in a given week and yell, yo, f sells pizza? <laughs> At least two or three. It's amazing, right? It really is. And then later in the day, uh, people hit the wall. <laughs> I walk by hey, hi, Gus. <laughs> and I, I'm like, huh? No, uh, oh, go, go ahead, you can go first. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but now with Revolution, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, show us the way. That's right. You know, it's post-apocalyptic, the power's back on, show us the way. Yeah, we want some strong leaders, yeah. and, and that's what we should demand. But we should demand strong leaders who also have a great, gracious uh, strength about them, but also are practical. Yeah. You know, yeah, I want to be smart and intelligent and all those things, but you know, I, am, I lead with my heart, I am who I am, I'm practical. And Tom Neville is, is, has some of that but I urge us all to, to follow folks that we 
really truly believe in and that we've done our research on who have some spirituality to be able to look inside of themselves first before they get in front of the mic and have their speech writers write their speeches mm -hmm. to say we should do this right. you know follow your heart you'll never go wrong what a gift man what a gift you are thank you so much you are amazing thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Revolution it's on city you got to watch it right back